Uh, today, uh, I wanted to focus with you on the text that was read. I am very sorry, I can't remember the name of the gentleman who read the verse, our opening verse, which was from Malachi chapter three, verse six, which is actually our passage for, for today that I would like us to, to reflect on. And uh, in that passage, if I can read it again, it says here, for I am the Lord, I do not change. Let me just bring it closer. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O children of Jacob, sons and daughters of Jacob. You are not consumed because I do not change. That's very interesting that, uh, that God's unchanging nature is tied to the fact that Israel is not consumed. Almost as if to say that uh, the fact that Israel still existed as a nation at this time, at this point in time, is all because there is a God who does not change. I want you to uh, pray with me for a quick minute as we reflect on this topic a changing world and changing God. A changing world and changing God. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you that we have this moment to share in your word as we listen to the scriptures that we have read. I pray that you will make them plain to us, give us understanding and comprehension and the ability to grasp the, the beauty and the power of your word, even as we reflect upon it, sanctify us in the truth, for your word is the truth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, uh, as you know, in most of our languages, be it English or Swahili or any of the languages of African people or a lot of uh, languages around the world, there are different words for year and change. So the word year is year, as in English, you will see when you hear year, you know that that refers to the 360 day period, 65 day period. And if you hear the word change, again, that is a different word that has to do with change. So you don't immediately in your mind, you don't get the connection between the two, but in the Hebrew, in the, in the Hebrew of, of, of Malachi and, and the ancient Hebrew speakers, the word for change and the word for year is the same word, basically. You hear the same thing when you say year and when you say change, you hear just about the same thing. So, for example, I could easily, for a Hebrew speaker, if I say Happy New Year, I might as well also say Happy New Change. Because the word change and the word year are the same word, basically, uh, at, at least as far as they sound, and even from the root, the root meaning of those two words. Change and year. So in the Hebrew mind, the notion of year points to the reality of change. For the Hebrew, the word change, as we have said, is the same word for year, as if to suggest that so long as our calendars move from year to year, so long there is the certainty of change. So this passage kind of conjures up in our mind the notion of change. God, of course, declares that he does not change that means obviously that some things do change. Indeed, things do change. Matter of fact, Kenyan politicians have a nice way of putting it in Kiluya to capture the idea that, that things do change. Gone are the days, for example, that we used to line up behind a telephone booth to make a phone call. These days, things have changed so rapidly that you can actually make a phone call 
on your hands without having to go to a telephone booth or without having to dial those long numbers because things have changed. The years have moved. The other day I was uh, telling a group of people that I, I realized that things have changed even for me. I used to be very good at climbing trees when I was a young boy. And so the other day I tried to, to climb a tree outside of my house right here. And uh, I was thinking, you know, I'm gonna bring all my skills of tree climbing that I thought I was so good at. But I realized that things have changed. I can no longer climb a tree as, a, as well as I used to in the, in, the, in the early years. I might as well say ancient years because it's been a quite a few more years down the line. But yes, the, 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 the one thing we have to know is that change does occur. Things do change. Nothing remains the same. Of course, God himself declares that he does not change. But then if that, by that very declaration, it's also an affirmation that other things do change. Everything around us changes. Our world changes. Our lives change, sometimes for better or sometimes for worse. Years roll by and we just turned our calendars to 2021, a few days ago, actually yesterday. And now we are on the second day of a brand new year. A year that is also subject to change into another year, but in it, while in it, we are bound to see changes, changes around us, changes in economies, changes in the world. Who would have known that the year 2020 would have turned into a year that we would not be free to visit? Matter of fact, I could probably be preaching in New Jersey Right now, if you had invited me to come, but here I am preaching from the comfort of my home, which is good in one sense, but also I get to miss the chance of getting to meet these wonderful young people who have extended this invitation to me. I could have been shaking your hands and getting to know your names and getting to understand your journey and interacting with you a little more closely, but things have changed. Thanks to coronavirus, which has devastated our world, I must acknowledge that with that change, it has brought pain in some lives. There are people who have not turned the year 2021 with some of their loved ones because they have been lost in the midst of the pandemic of the coronavirus. Yes, some families did not celebrate the arrival of the new year with rejoicing because the year that I was going by had been a year of pain and loss and sickness. Loss, not just of lives, sad as that is, loss of jobs, changes in the financial circumstances. In the families, the statistics show that even uh, uh, domestic violence has gone up, some changes to disrupt our world in ways that probably will be permanent. Yes, change is certain. Our world is bound to change. With change, things change. Relationships change. Careers change. Economic situations change. Nothing remains constant except God who declares that he does not change. With that, affirmation of change and the certainty of change. Of course, we are going to need a God who is constant in the midst of all these changes and these flux and these uncertainties and these um, uh, vicissitudes of life that are being touched and being altered almost permanently in our world. Yes, change is permanent. Change is certain to occur. My question is, how do you manage that change?
when we think of change, I want to emphasize young people at this point that we need to reflect on the fact that years come and years go and learn the fact that we need to make the most out of the years that we have because we will not always, always have them. We will not always have those years. You know, when I was in high school many, many years ago, our, the headmaster of my school used to always tell us every morning in, in parade, we, we call it parade, assembly. Every morning students will uh, uh, line up and assemble before the beginning of the school. And uh, in that uh, session of uh, assembly, uh, announcements will be made, uh, major issues will be addressed for the well-being of the institution. And so the headmaster of my school, the, we call them the, the principal, the head teacher, will be referred to as the headmaster. Uh, the, the head teacher would always tell us, young people, you will not always be young like this. Your faces will not always be smooth as they are today. Time will come when you will grow older. And I need you to make the most out of this time and being youthful and, and we, we even thought that no, that will not happen to us. We thought we'll always be young. We thought we'll always be energetic and, and able to run and able to do things. We had so much energy, but very little up here. Yes, change will come. Yes, years will roll by. Year after year, we'll see new things coming into our world. The question is, how will we manage those changes? The question is, how will we use the time that we have, the years that we have? The psalmist even prays in Psalm 90, that is attributed to Moses, he asks teachers to number our years of that we might be wise in applying ourselves to the time and, and the years that you have given us. Because the years will come and go. We will sh 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 flip the calendar. We will be in one year and we'll be in another year. Time will roll by and every time will come with its own. You know, we have a saying, in, uh, in, in law language, there is a saying that every day that comes, comes with its own unique circumstances. Yes, change is certain. But do we know how to manage that change? Do we know how to number our years? How to put to good use? You know, sometimes I've often, uh, yeah, uh, young people have often I uh, felt very guilty. One time I had a good friend of mine in the city of Nairobi and I was busy that time I was serving as the youth director for the union, running programs, doing God's work, and going to making trips and, and making programs and arrangements and meetings and say board sessions. And I had a good friend of mine who was sick in hospital. And I I kept planning to go and visit him. I kept planning to go and visit him in the hospital. But I said, let me finish this meeting. Let me make this phone calls. Let me arrange for this meeting. Let me get this going before I can make my trip to the hospital. And before I could go to that hospital to meet one of my good friends who was dying in hospital, the next thing I hear is that my friend had passed away. That's many years ago. And the pain of, of not having had a chance to go and see him stayed with me for a long time. And so the question is, do we make the most of the time that we have? Do we do the things that are important? I felt that I should have left aside some of the important, so-called important things that I was doing, God's work, supposedly, to go and be with my friend and spend some time with him before he slept in the Lord, thankfully. And so 
I'm going to challenge each one of us today to make the most of the time that we have because years will roll by and years will roll by and we will not always be young. We will always be having new years. Thanks to that person who will be wise enough to number his or her days. And so causes of change. Let me reflect a little bit that some changes are more drastic and exert far more consequences on, on, on the earth, on, in the world, in our world. Well, other changes are imperceptible at times. Some changes are for good and some changes are for worse. Changes are brought by events such as pandemics, as we just saw and as we still see. Calamities, tsunamis, earthquakes, and famines, and diseases, and political struggles, wars, and other earth-shaking events. While some changes are beyond human causation, others such as wars are caused by human greed for power, human competition for resources. Notice I didn't say limited resources because our world has lots of resources, but it is human greed that, that hoards all the resources that competes those who are able to amass resources, amass wealth, will continue to amass wealth at the, the, uh, to, at the expense of others. Human greed for power and competition for resources is a result of human greed and avarice and selfishness. Those who have resources do not want to share with those who don't. Those who have amassed those who have advantage will want to keep the advantages. That's what we are seeing even in the political arena. It is all a struggle over resources, over control of resources and privilege. Yes, and those are the causes of suffering and pain, suffering of poverty, causes of poverty and lack of access to opportunities is all a result of human greed. But also our world has seen changes, changes that have been motivated by love, changes that have been motivated by courage, changes that have been motivated by the love of God, inspiring men and women to stand up for what is right. One, one of my favorite writers, Ellen White says that men and women who are willing to stand up for what is right, even though the heavens fall, that is the want of our world. Our world needs men and women who will call sin by its right name, men and women who will stand for what is true, even though the heavens fall. Yes, some people have sacrificed to bring change in our world. We can think of not just the Mahatma Gandhi's or the Nelson Mandela's or the Rosa Parks or the Martin Luther King Jr. Yes, all these have been motivated by values that are rooted in Christ, in God's love. They are rooted in values of self selflessness, values of love and justice and fairness. Yes, their are humaneness and what is right. These values, have inspired men and women to stand up and bring changes in their world, in their communities, in their churches. So today I'm challenging young people, the Good Samaritan, I thank you for your name because your name is a challenge in itself because it's the name that suggests that you are willing to sacrifice your comfort for the other person as the good Samaritan did in scriptures. That is the essence of being a follower of Christ. Yes, biblical faith is incongruent with greed, selfishness, discrimination, injustice, and deprivation of human rights and dignity. Biblical faith cannot 
go hand in hand with these values of greed and selfishness and discrimination and injustice. Only those who have been motivated by this sense of justice, this sense of what is right. You know, God told the children of Israel, let me emphasize this point of this notion of what is right. God told the children of Israel, if you look at the book of Deuteronomy, that you will pursue what is right and what is right only shall you pursue. God's people cannot stand back and see some of the evils that are perpetrated in our world today. You know, just recently, this last October, I visited, I live in Alabama, for those of you who don't know. So I visited Montgomery and, uh, and Birmingham these are places where we have some museums that preserve the memories of some of the uh, brutalities and atrocities that were committed against the slaves in this country. And just watching, looking at the lynching, there's one that is called the lynching museum, where you see people being hung and being beaten and being roasted as, as, as meat while people are sitting there and watching as though it was a spot. Made me wonder what human being can do this? What human being can sit there and watch such inhumanity against fellow human being? And that's why I want to emphasize that biblical faith requires that we stand against greed, against selfishness, against discrimination and injustice and all forms of inhumanity. Biblical faith cannot stand. And therefore, if we're gonna be people, men and women of change that inspire change in their communities and in their churches, we must be men and women who are imbued by God's sense of what is right. You know, many times when we talk about managing change now, switching now to this notion of managing change, the world can have all kinds of wisdom and ideas on how to manage change. I'm reminded of a, of a story by a guy by the name Spencer Johnson, who wrote the, the, the little, little book that is called Who Moved My Cheese? In that Who Moved My Cheese story, we is a fable. It's like a parable. It's a, a little story about uh, four mice, four mice who live in a maze. These mice live in a maze and they all love to eat cheese. And so one day the cheese disappeared. And one of those four mice is called Scurry, another one is Sniff, another one is Paul, another one is Ham. So Sniff and Scurry, when they woke up one morning and there was no more cheese in the maze, they simply moved out and went looking for, they went looking for, for cheese elsewhere. Well, Ham and Hall felt betrayed and they started complaining hoping for the old cheese to return. Paul realized finally after whining and complaining for a long time that it won't be helpful to just sit there and whine. So he, he set out into the maze in search for cheese. And so as he goes around, he, he writes some of his lessons on the wall in the, through the maze. Uh, hoping that his friend Ham will follow and can read the directions how to find the cheese. Finally, by the time uh, by the time Hall finds some cheese, he finds that Scurry and Sniff had been all along enjoying some cheese. They had found new cheese. The story, of course, the moral of the story is that yes, change will come. Things around us will change, but when they do. We need not sit there and wallow and complain and hope that the old cheese will one day return. 
We need to get out and go look for new cheese. Make changes in our lives. Get a new job. Train for a new career. If the job that you're looking for, that you that that you had been paying your bills comes to an end, yes, it is time to go look for new cheese. Yes, we may have all that wisdom. We may have all that earthly knowledge on how to manage change. People who study organizations will tell you that any organization that does not know how to deal with change will soon be out of business. Yes, we know that. And those are good. They have their place. Those change theories are important even for personal life and for even for the church. Even the church needs to know how to deal with change. Already, we have adapted to some change right here because with the coronavirus, we are able to join each other on Zoom or through other video uh, outlets and still be able to, to interact and still be able to have church, still be able to sing and praise our Lord. That is an adaptation to change. Instead of just sitting at home and saying, well, since we can't go to church, so we're not going to have any worship. No, this is you're demonstrating that you have moved out and looked for new cheese in the face of change. But I want to talk to you about, for the next few minutes before I finish, that yes, all those techniques and all those theories of change management are good and they have their rightful place. So I'm not disparaging them. But I want to draw your attention only to one God who does not change. Even though everything changes around us, we should be assured that our God does not change. He is the constant. All other things are variables, but God is constant. He is not changed by human avarice and, and greed and whims. He is predictable. He is dependable. He is there when you need him. The assurance that God does not change is what Malachi is telling the children of Israel in the face of their own rebellion against God. When the tsunamis of change come, we can hide in him who is our rock. Yes, when all around my soul gives way, the singer sings, he is hope and stay. He is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Christ is our solid rock in whom we stand while all other ground is sinking sand. One songwriter says, a mighty fortress is our God. The Lord's our rock and in him we hide. Surely our anchor holds into that which is within the veil. Yes, the God of years. Oh Lord, our, our, our God in, in ages, past and future. He is the one who is the same yesterday, today and forevermore. He is there when you wake up in the morning. He is there when it is hurting. He is there when you are disappointed. He is there when you are in pain. He is there in the face of the loss of a loved one. He is there unchanging. He is a God who is unchanging. You know, I'm reminded of the, of the, of the song that is well known that, was, that has been sung across this country. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. Unchanging hands. Because we have a God who does not change. One of the things that I want to point out here is that many times when we read this passage in, 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 uh, in Malachi chapter 3 verse 6, for I am the Lord, I do not change, therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob, we fail to read that second line right there. Many times we, we use this passage 
to talk about the fact that God's commandments do not change, that the Sabbath does not change. The Sabbath has not changed from Saturday to Sunday. And, and our God is a God whose laws cannot change. But when you look at this context properly, you discover that the, the fact that God does not change was, was asserted to make a different point. The fact that Israel should not have been in existence by this time. Malachi is saying that Israel history is checkered with rebellion and violation of God's covenant. That's Malachi's contention here. Israelites were steeped in sorcery, disregard of sacred things, lack of faith in God, demonstrated by failure to return a faithful tithe, destruction of institution of marriage, alienation of children from their parents and parents from their children. Priests who are offering sacrifices were offering lame animals, meaning God was taking the back seat in the minds of Israelites. God was getting what was left over. People were busy investing in the stock market, busy building houses, buying land and building, investing in matatus. And people were preoccupied with economic pursuits. People were trying to better their lives, business interests, marriages were being broken left, right and center. God was so tired of all of the divorce cases pending in the courts, you would think that those statistics were reflecting the secular world. Priests who are both religious and political leaders at this time had neglected their responsibility as messengers of the Lord and were not proclaiming the word of God to the people. These were some of the complaints of, of Malachi. As if that was not annoying enough to God, the people were still acting like they did not know what was happening. And so they were asking questions. How have we? You know, look at, look at chapter one of Malachi. Look at chapter one. They say, so God is saying, I have loved you, says the Lord. But what are the Israelites saying? In what ways have you loved us? Are you listening to me? God is reassuring them that I have loved you. But the children of Israel are still asking, in what ways have you loved us? Okay, then God is saying, okay, you people have wearied me. You have wearied me. For the Lord of Israel says, uh, uh, you have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, in what ways have we wearied him? Israel is still acting like they don't know what, is, what they are doing. It's one thing to be disrespectful and to be unkind. And it is another to act as if nothing has happened. You know, many times in life, we have people who will who will show disrespect or disregard. But instead of coming and acknowledging, I am sorry, I'm sorry for what I've done or even owning up to what they have done and accepting what they have done, they act as if nothing has happened. They expect you to treat them as if nothing has happened. This is the children of Israel taking God for granted, even asking in what ways have you loved us? In what ways have we weeded you? In what ways have we robbed you? You know, at one time, like it says, you have robbed me. You are a curse. Oh, in what ways have we robbed you? They keep asking these kinds of questions. In what ways? If it was some of us, you know, some of us uh, as teachers, you know, sometimes as a teacher, you're teaching and students ask some questions that you think are, um, you know, kind of not very smart. But God is so gracious. Instead of God saying, why are you not asking me such a, a, a question? God is still gracious. He still answers their question. And so there is a lesson for all those of us who teach that sometimes students may ask questions that in your mind will sound like not very appropriate, not very smart. 
But again, you need to have the magnanimity, the, the patience that God has with the children of Israel, that he still answers those questions. God does not answer the questions one by one. God answered the questions one by one, hoping that, uh, that the people will find that their task is clear before them. He takes the opportunity to announce the coming of the messenger of the covenant, even in the midst of this. The children of Israel are still asking in what ways they have annoyed God, in what ways they have robbed God, in what ways they have wielded God. God is saying, you are a cursed nation. If it was not because I don't change, you would have been wiped out of this planet Earth. You see, brothers and sisters, some of us are here today only because of a God who does not change. God is affirming that it is because my love, my loving kindness, my chesed, the, the Hebrew notion of, of God's loyalty that does not change, that is constant, regardless of what happens, is what kept Israel as a nation. Israel, by the time of Malachi, had no right to exist. They had violated the covenant and there was no reason for them to still be called God's people. But it is because we have a God who does not change, who is loving and whose kindness and grace is abounding, who abounds in forgiveness and goodness and mercies. That is why the children of Israel were still in existence. So this notion that God does not change is more to remind us that we thank God because we have a God who is still the same yesterday, today, and forever, whose forgiveness is forever more plenteous. Oh yes, the psalmist says, oh Lord, if you are to regard iniquity, who could stand? But you have plenteous redemption and forgiveness. That is the reason Malachi affirms God's unchanging nature. And yes, many of us have crossed into this year because of a God who does not change. Many of us have not been as careful. It's probably it's not because we've been so careful, even from the virus, that we are still here. It is because of a God who does not change. But this God who does not change, even in the midst of a loss, still he does not change. Still his love is the same. His grace is the same. Even to those families who have lost loved ones in this pandemic, God's love has not changed. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still the healer. He announces that for you who wait upon the Lord, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. Yes, the son of righteousness still arises with healing in his wings. Yes, he's still a healer. Even when you didn't come out, or your loved one did not come out of that hospital. When they put the tubes in their noses and in their lungs, and you couldn't even visit them at the hospital. And the next thing we heard was that there were no more. We still have a God who does not change. The son of righteousness still arises with healing in his wings. Because he's a God who does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's constant. He's still a healer that he was at the time of Malachi. He's still a healer today. And as if to confirm that Jesus Christ dies on the cross of Calvary as the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. Yes, by his stripes we are healed. That's the one who does not change. As if to confirm that he does not change, he sends Jesus Christ. Soon after Malachi, we move next to Matthew and we see the arrival of Jesus Christ, the son of righteousness, who arises with healing in his wings. 
And so today I want to pray that you, as we get into this new year, which has changed into 2021, that you hold on to God's unchanging hands. Yes, our world will change. Things will change around us. Our lives will change. People around us will change. Circumstances will change. But I'm going to hold on to a God who does not change. Amen.